I'm really glad to see that there is still many people in the room because when I was thinking about doing psychology in a hacker conference, I thought I would be as welcome as Zuckerberg in a data privacy conference or something. Um, but you're still there for the moment, so everything's cool. Um, while I was preparing this talk, um, I realized that I was quite optimistic because 45 minutes to teach you what I try to learn in hundreds of hours will be a bit difficult. I know that you are all brilliant minds and you have big brains, but I have a small data rate for transferring information. So I will try to condense as much as possible. And I propose that I will take you through a journey where I will leave all the small details on the side and try to explain you more or try to uh, make you feel how our, our brain is working. And I propose that we take that, because we are in a hacker conference, in the reverse engineering of the human. But first, I have a little question just to warm up your mind, although it's already well done, I think. Knowing that the brain has an average of 86 billion neurons, how many connections between neurons, that what you call synapses, can we find in the brain of an adult? And little int, we have, on average, between 7,000 and 50,000 connections per neurons to other neurons. It's a lot. Huh? 100 to 500 trillions. If you want to compare with a, a core i7, the biggest one, there is something like 2.6 billion circuits in there. So. The brain is still better than this, but it's like comparing oranges and apple. It doesn't mean a lot so far. So let's go to our little assignment. We need to hack humans. I propose that we will use two uh, well-known representatives of the uh, human species, Bob and Alice. It seems that those two are together because they exchange a lot of messages recently. But let's see. Let's start with the uh, hardware rivers. I mean, I'm not really a good hacker, but most of the time we start with the hardware. It's what you have in front of you. So good looking. I guess you won't look at the uh, cryptography the same way next time. What do we have? A body, a bit different for the male and the woman, but if you look at it, you have a big microprocessor with some ASIC on the side to do some specific task, two HD cameras, colors, colors only in the middle, not on the side, and with a really good movement detection. Two microphones, one speaker, sometimes i5 for some of them, and a really, really big hard disk. Except we can put a lot of things in it, but it's really hard to retrieve. That's something you will see after. Just for, you know, because there is a myth that we are multitasking. That's not true. We do time sharing. And as you can see, the more you increase the task, the better we become. That's obvious, huh? And yes, it's true for women too. Look at the CPU. It's a bit uh, different from ours. Each region has some function. The, f the front of the, the brain is used to do all the executive function, the sorting, prioritization. You have the, uh, the part of the brain that manages the, the muscle, the sensors, the eyes, the ears, everything is there. And you have a big USB called the uh, spinal cord that will transfer information to the rest. That's just for the, a bit for the fun, but you will see. If you take a section of the brain, you will see there that each part of your body has a specific location in the brain to manage the sensors and also the motors. And the little dwarf that you see there, it's a human with the proportion of the size of the neurons that you have in the brain. Big ends. Just a little first tip if you have to 
ask someone, and it can work also with your kids, when you ask someone to do something, just touch him. On the hand, thank you, on the shoulder, it will increase the likelihood that this person will do what you ask. Just because you become a bit intimate somewhere. You went through the... Let's continue. There is a database there, a big one. You can see on the picture, uh, it's a bit ugly, you know, but uh, there is a lot of those nerves that we use to communicate. We have the same in the brain. Nerves are just dendrites and axiom with electrical current going through it. It always goes into one direction to the other one, although it's not always true, but most of the time it going to the, from the dendrite to the, uh, the neurons. And the little yellow gain that you see are just there to make the current flow faster. That's why kids are a bit clumsy, because they don't have it yet before seven years old. So the current is much small, uh, slower with them. Why am, am I talking about it? It's because there is something quite interesting in the, in the nerves at the end. When you have the connection between the, the terminals, axioms, and the next neurons, exchange of information is going not electrical, although it's sometimes the case we will see it, but chemical, meaning that the neurons will just release a little chemical particle that will be captured by the other one and will trigger a new signal. You see the chemical, the electrical one? The thing with the chemical is that it's a bit slower, but it allows you to go faster because it increases the gain. And also, you can release some proportion of those chemical substance that we call neurotransmitters, while the electrical one is just on and off, and it's on short distance. You just find them in the brain. Why are we talking about this? Is because those neurotransmitters, there is a bit more than 200 different kind of them. Although you see the, the glutamate and the, the GABA are 99% of all the, the ones you use. But the other one is interesting, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. You maybe have heard about it. Uh, the neurons that use those specific uh, neurotransmitters have really specific function in the brain and will give specific reaction into our behaviors. Just also to understand, because I'm an IT guy. Huh? I did psychology after. I mean, IT is one zero. It's easy to understand. It's logical. The brain... Imagine, 7,000 connections between each neuron, 15,000, it's a lot of possibilities, and you have some of those neurotransmitters, the, uh, the glutamate, with excitatory, and the other one were inhibitory, meaning if I have just an electrical current going to the end of my neurons, sending a signal to the next one, it reaches a certain threshold, the next current goes to the next one. But... If before that, I have a current on another kind of neurons with inhibitors, and then, oops, oh, too fast. Okay. But then you will not reach this threshold and nothing happen. That's two neurons. When you have 7,000, it's really difficult to predict what will trigger a neuron or not. So basically, the brain is really analogic more than digital. That's for sure. And nothing is never guaranteed. That's why we're sometimes erratic. Anything can change it. So, we talk sometimes about neurotransmitters and also about hormones. They can be, we can use the same name because they're the same chemical component, except that the neurotransmitter and the neurons, the hormones are in your bloodstream most of the time. They're used to communicate with the entire body. When I take some hormones like testosterone or cortisol, cortisol is the hormone of stress, it will increase my heart rate, my breathing. It will also shut down some part of my brain just because cortisol is the hormone of stress and stress is, you know, something that is triggered when you, f you feel fear. And if you feel fear and you're in front of, let's say, a big lion in, in the jungle, you're not supposed to do, oh, it's a nice day today. A lot of people here, no. There's the lion and there's the, the exit. And you just have to run toward the exit. That's what you're supposed to do. So 
cortisol will just switch off all the other part that just say, hey, it's a nice day. It will just say, problem, solution. All those neurons, and you have a lot of them you've seen, one of them, one specific kind of them, using dopamine and dopamine is called the reward system. Every time you have desire, that you have pleasure, that you are craving for reward, anything that you want food or something, that's irresponsible. It's a culprit. And that will be our friend to act people because it works really well and it makes us addict of whatever you want. The good thing is that it's always the same path, always the same neurons. And anything you will supply to him that will trigger it will work. So sometimes you can just replace one trigger by another one, for the brain is the same, and so you can have the same result even if you... Meaning, if I don't give to someone what he wants, but I give him something else that will trigger the same path, it works too. So you can be quite creative. Oh, and just forget also, that's something, behaviorism. You know Pavlov? Most of you, the dogs, huh? the little bell, he gives food, and the next time that they ring the bell, the, the dog <laughs> The thing is, when you want to have a, you, when we want to uh, reinforce a behavior, you need to give the reward just after the little stimulus. If you wait too long, it loses the effect. So do it fast. It brings us, because it was a short pass on the hardware, the fact that between neurotransmitter and chemical and some behavior, there is a direct link. Some behavior will trigger some hormones release. Some hormone release will trigger some behavior or change in behaviors. And yes, the brain is strongly influenced by some chemicals. You don't need a PhD for that. It means that the best security can probably be defeated by a few beer and a talk, or the stuff too. And I know it works. Then we go to the software, the operating system. You see the version. Human is there for uh, what 120,000 years. We still have the same brain. Doesn't change. The software it evolves with all of us, but just for each of us. But the, the biggest part is still the same. So it's version 1.3 or something like this, minor updates. But we have a lot of fork of it. Meaning it's really difficult to predict what it will give for you, for me, for anyone here. Yeah. You need to adapt to everybody. The brain has two main functions. The first, globally, it's to survive. And in order to do that, it's, it has to make sense of the world. You have seen all those sensors, those motors, it's a lot of information. It has to treat, process all that and in order to make sense, it does a lot of pattern analysis. We are really good in pattern analysis. Little riddle. What's next? Hmm? Yeah, it's one, three, five, seven. That's easy. Most of you can do it. I mean, that's why our brain is there. The thing is, let's try this one. It's a difficult one. In fact, if there is a logic, I don't know it. I try to find something without logic. The thing is, how do you feel when you see that and you are not able to solve the, the thing? I don't know for you, but me, it makes me crazy. Our brain doesn't like not understanding a pattern. It makes us stressed. The thing is, when I have that kind of thing, what do you see? A cube, but it's not a cube. I mean, our brain doesn't like something you cannot understand, so sometimes we just invent and fill the gap. That's what creates the illusions. Same thing here. 
we see things. Who doesn't see the triangle? Everybody, where is there a triangle there? Nowhere. We just fill the gaps. Same thing here. It's a cube. Okay, let's say, remove some of them. You still see a cube somewhere. Why there is nothing. We fill the gap. And sometimes, even if it doesn't make sense, we continue. And you can look at it and know that it doesn't make sense and you still see it. That's the ASIC processors, you know, the thing that they've been trained to do some work. They do it really well, really fast, but sometimes they screwed up. One of the things that you need to know to ask someone is that if you make something that is inconsistent, that will trigger those stress, they will be more vigilant and they will start using another system that will be much more difficult to hack. Yeah, here you. I don't click too fast, but A and B, same color. Then looks like. Pay attention. It's the same color. It means that the context will change everything the way your, your brain will work. What do you see? Circle. Second circle, what do you see? And then. And now. I add information more and more, and all together they form something, and now what you see is a face, while it was just a few circles and lines. And it's really difficult to block that. Meaning, we have those ASIC processors that we can really act because they do something, but we cannot stop them, even if sometimes we, we know that it's difficult. Another thing that is quite speci specific to our brain is that that's a table. The other one too. Do they look the same? No, but you know they are tables. You don't have to think about it. Meaning what we do, grouping, categorization. And we also know that tables with chairs are part of the furniture. When I say, hey, draw me a table, what do you do? Which one do you select? Most of the time, the easy one. Huh? It's what we call the stereotypes, or the prototypes, in fact. For every representation of an object, there is the, ver the simple version that allows us to have an idea, an image of it. And that's what creates also the stereotypes. What do you see there? A man with a bird, Caucasian, blue eyes, marine cap. And if I ask you what do you know about this man, you will maybe say, Oh, he must be hardworking, social, trustable. The stereotypes. No, if I tell you on those two pictures, there is one who has served time in jail. Which one? The thing is, if I do that, no, he's back on the list of the, the trustable guys. The other one did time. Same thing here. If you have to choose, you will say, hmm, tattoo. Probably bad. Except if you have tattoo yourself. And still. Basically, the context and some little details will allow you to be anyone, anybody, and to make people believe anything. Because when they don't have the information, they fill the gap. And you can feed them with all those things. It's something that we call the halo effect. Uh, it's a tendency to uh, use information that we have and project it to something else for which we don't have information. Just to explain it simply, if you're good looking, people will think that you're smarter than most of the people. If you wear a suit, you're probably some authority position. You're director or something. If you have dirty clothes, oh, you're, prob you're probably less organized than anybody else. I mean, where is it true? 
nowhere, but that's what we think. We use that all the time. Salesmen for, for the cars. Why is there always a woman beside a car? Because people believe that if the woman is really beautiful, hey, and I have the car, I will have the woman. It's an association. And in fact, you can have the yellow effect. It's the same woman, but you won't think the same thing with the right picture because there is a dog. Just a tip for people who are alone, single, picture with a dog or a cat works better. Always. It makes you look like you're more social, nice, kind, etc. Always the details. If I'm a man, I have a suit, a white shirt, a bird, I have a dog or a kid in my, in my hand, people will trust me. It's like it. If I have a really nice Metallica t-shirt, a dirty uh, jeans, maybe not. Why? It's because our brain is doing something quite simple. A equal B, B equal C, so A equal C. It's basic. And we do that with words also. Chocolate, dessert, coffee, pancakes. Just by reading the names, you already start thinking about the dessert that you just had. And if I talk about the little dessert I had yesterday with the ice cream, you know, vanilla bourbon on the top of a really warm chocolate cake, you may be already angry now. Just words will trigger the same reaction in your brain that the real deal. That's magic, no? You can make things appear. Storytelling is even f something that is way behind just the words. When you tell a story to people, you can see their brain light up on the MRI machines. It's like they were living the thing. And if they can identify themselves to your story, wow, bingo. When you go to a movie, that's what happens. If it's a good movie, I mean, you know one of the movies to which people identify themselves the most is Star Wars in the, in the US. Huh? They did the study in the US. I mean, was a lightsaber at home, a real one, I mean? Was flew uh, an X-wing? Nobody. Was a, a Chewbacca in a, driving as a co-pilot? Nobody. So it doesn't mean to be real. It just means that you feel something, a connection, because you suffer the same way, because anything. You have probably a book that moves you, that made you tear, or that changed your life. They were just words on paper. But words can do that. We'll come back at it. The thing is, the microprocessor and the ASIC, they work two different ways. The stereotypes is part of the, uh, the fast way of processing the data. They work really well. They're energy efficient. You don't have to focus. You don't have to, to say, I want to do that. It's like the illusion. You don't have to think about it. It just comes like this. But if you want to think about something and say, hey, what they are saying, is it true, really? Then you need to focus. Then it will take time, energy, a lot of effort, focus. Most of the time, we use a fast mode. When do we use the other one? It seems that we have, a, in psychology, a, a model called the direct proce processing model. The theory is that whenever someone says something to you, you will believe it. Except if before something triggers your vigilance. The guy already told you five lies in the past, mm, probably you won't listen. Or he's doing some strange face while talking, maybe you won't. But most of the time, he gets in and it's stored and it's flagged as true. That's what happens when you go to school when you're a kid. They tell you a lot of things. And you say, yeah, it's true, of course. You see how powerful it can be. 
manipulating people. You just say things. If you say it the right way, it doesn't trigger any vigilance. That's it. You have just implanted stuff into their brain. In fact, we can even create false memories in your brain. There was a really nice experiment where they asked people to watch a movie of a woman driving his car and then having an accident. And to the first group, they said, Hey, did the woman pass the red light? And to the other one, they didn't ask anything. And then they asked both groups to, to watch two movies, one with the red light and one, one with, without. And they said, which one was the original movie? To the one to whom, to whom they asked, was, did she pass the red light? They saw, they say, yes, the one with the red light, except that there was no red light in the original movie. If you tell them, yes, we implanted the, the memory into your brain, they say, no, no way, I'm sure of it. If you want to influence people, there's four tricks. Oh, there is more than this, huh? but time, time pressure. You know it. Huh? If you have any phishing email, it's always urgent. Why is it urgent? Because it's urgent. The slow model is slow. You don't have time, you take the fast one. So you go back to stereotypes all the time. When you need to study stereotypes, the only thing that you do, you say to people, you have five seconds to answer. Poof, stereotypes. Authority is the same. If someone asks you to do something and is your boss, jump. Yes, sir. Jump. You don't start to, uh, to ask questions. Emotions. Oh, that's a real powerful one. We'll discuss that. And history also. Because the way you have experiment, experimented any situation before will modify the way you will experiment it after. You know the, the saying, I don't know if it's in the same in English, but if you have been burned with hot water, you will take we will pay attention with cold water too. It's always true. Your history is modifying the way you will think. If you have been bitten by a dog once, you will be really cautious with all the dogs, even with the nice one. It changes your perception. Everything there is a frame. It's a context. And context is everything. That's a different emotion that you can have, but we'll come back to that. Just saying, if you want to play on, remote, on rewards for, with someone, smile. Don't look sad. If you want to uh, use authority, look angry. There's a way to, uh, if you want to, uh, to see who are the directors in a company, it's easy. There's always a guy with the, the, the face a bit looking like they're angry all the time. Busy and angry all the time. Managers. If you want to look altruistic, uh, a bit sad, help me. It works really well. So, motivation. That comes from the CIA. They have a really good, man you know, what they do, those spies. They're manipulating people, and they all say there is four triggers. Fear, rewards, altruism, and self-coherence. Fear is a strong emotion. There is a dedicated path also in the nerves for that. It goes everywhere. When there is fear, everything changes. The way you think change. The way your body reacts. For the rewards, we talk about it. You're craving for it. Sugar, sex, all the time. Money, food. Altruism is something different. And there is a reason why it's there, is that as a species, if we want to build something, we need to work together. And if you do something for someone, there is, it's more likely that he will do something for you. So we tend to do things for the others. And we kind of like it. Self-coherence is basically what I told you before, is that we try to see patterns and we, we want that they make sense. But we want to have the same pattern for us that we apply on ourselves, the story that we tell about ourselves, to be coherent too. If I say, hey, I like animals, I'm a vegetarian, 
and then I will go to eat a steak. Something go wrong. Oh, I will have to change the label and say, I'm a, what do you call that, a flexitarian or no, something? Or I will say, yeah, but I was really hungry, I need to eat something. When you're not in that state of coherence, we call that cognitive dissonance. It's something that is quite often used to make people change their behavior. You just pinpoint what is wrong in, in their story, and then they're stressed and they need to change something. It's quite good motivation. Another thing that you can do is also change the, um, the frame and a bit manipulate it. That's a house. If you look at it, it's for sale, you will maybe say, hey, it was 800,000 euro. Okay. No? You put a price on it. Three million. Hey, it's way too expensive. I mean, three millions, guys. Okay. How much does it cost, you? do you think? And now you come with one million. It's called anchoring. You provide the numbers. Even if the number is irrealistic, you're redefining the norm, and people will move it above, and you can, can do the same below. If you make it for, if you say it's for sale for 1,000 euro, people will say 700,000. Even professionals, even if you tell them that you're tricking them. So the summary for that. Define the frame, the context, if you need to ask someone. With, if defining the frame, you, you can do whatever. We can all become monsters in the right context. Think about war. People, when they come back from war, they're still dead, they're still normal people, but there they kill people. Some even torture others. Why? Because there is a frame that says, it's allowed. If you play a video game, it's the same. You change the frame, and now you can, you can drive five, 300 kilometers per hour in a city, in some games. You can shoot people. You don't become a maniac or a killer after that, because you switch the frame back to normal life. But if you can define a frame in which what you expect from people is acceptable, perfect. You just need to come with the right story. Always be consistent. It must make sense. The minute it doesn't make sense, vigilance, and you lose everything. Pick a motivation for the change and use the emotion accordingly. So stay consistent. And then redefine the norm. What you, add, what you expect from them is not something that they do normally. Change the norm. Explain them that for everybody else, it's normal in that framework. And it will work. They will do it because that's the right thing to do. That's it. I hope I wasn't too complicated. Any question? Any questions? You're all too shocked. I have a question for you. Right at the beginning, you said if you want to get somebody to do something for you, touch them. But when I've worked for people, bosses and things, when the boss comes and does that kind of touch you on the shoulder like you're doing great work, I always feel the guy is being completely false. Yeah. Yeah, and there is some subtlety there. Huh? You, it's indeed, if you come here, no, it's just thank you. You see, it's, it sh should be natural. Same thing. Mm -hmm. If it's not consistent. I had a, a boss. She was a, not really liked by the people. And at some point there was, you know, those survey. And... Um, in the survey, they said, yeah, the, the management doesn't care for us. And she told me, what should I do? Should I go there and say hello to all of them every morning? I say, nobody will believe it. It's not you. I mean, if you do it tomorrow, they will say, something is happening. <laughs> no, but she just needed to, to do it. Sometimes just listen. So there is a pattern. You can change a bit the pattern, but not too much either. Any... Any other questions? You're all thinking about bosses touching you on the shoulder? <laughs> As you said in the beginning, this topic is obviously much, much wider than this presentation and will not fit for the 45 minutes. What will be the best book for this topic that you would suggest to, to read? 
Oh. I'm starting the list. It will be on the slide, but you can already start with the, those okay, three. Okay, you're already things. manipulating me, I guess. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Mr. Milgram. That's it. Oh, question over there. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, do you have any tricks to uh, try not to uh, remove uh, all the manipulation, but to try to uh, abstract yourself from those uh, those techniques? You want to, uh, just to be sure I understand you, you mean? To avoid... Uh, to, to avoid being manipulated. Yeah. When you know the tricks, you see them coming. I mean, you, you know this, I made those seminars last week, I explain to people that we use something called implicits. Uh, you, you go to a, uh, a garage, you, you see the, the, the car, and the guy is coming and says, oh, in which color do you want to take it? Implicitly, it means you want to take the car. He asks a question, but he's telling you that you, uh, you desire the car or something. And they use that trick all the time. Also, they ask for something small, and then they go further. There is a lot of things that are used to, to manipulate people. The, the, the good thing is, you can try to learn all of them, and I'm not sure I have finished with that because uh, I have a long list of uh, things to, to read. Um, or you can just come back to what is important for me. I have my values, I have the things that are important for me. People ask me to do something. Is it really something I want to do? But the thing is, it means that you have to come back to your slow thinking all the time. So it's not always easy. So what do you do? You know the people you can trust, and you know when you're not sure. When you're not sure, just pay attention. But the thing they use most of the time is pressure, the time pressure. So as soon as someone is saying, it's urgent or hurry up, just slow down. Any... Thanks. Um, great talk. Uh, do you have any recommendations for, let's say, people of our times now and our politics? Because I see these tricks being played heavily currently yeah, with, really with internet speed. Yeah, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Um, Except for slow down, right? Yeah, Go yeah, to nature. <laughs> politician, they use uh, in the book... That's really an excellent book. Uh, Kahneman won the uh, Nobel Prize of Economy in 2000 something. He's a psychologist. Psychologist, Nobel Prize of Economy. Why? Because he showed that we uh, do not think in a rational way. Before that, economists say people are rational. And he showed clearly that it was not the case. And one of the things that, it was that they discovered is that when you ask a person a complicated question, we tend to answer her using a simplest question, meaning it's, we just vote. Who read the, uh, the program of all the, uh, of all the candidates? Wow, congratulations. <laughs> That's devotion. Most of us didn't do. I tried. With my wife, we tried. We said we have, she has a PhD. I, I did, I mean, we have, and we were not able to, f to understand what was different from, me, from one to another. So at the end, you cannot answer the question, which one do you want to vote? So what do you do most of the time? You vote for the guy you know. You vote for the guy that has a nice, nice smile. In fact, there is a lot of studies showing that in the U.S. elections, it's 80% of the time is the tallest guy that wins. It's a bit strange, no? <laughs> so, okay. uh, another question from me: Is this cross-cultural? There is or, or cultural the same things work, uh, working across cultures. So. Cultural is something that defines the, the context. So some of the things will not work in some culture, of course. Uh, touching people, I will not recommend it in all culture, of course. Um, so you need to always to adapt. As I said, there is seven billion fork of the program, so you need to understand what is different. The thing is, even in, uh, if you talk about countries, uh, you have subcultures in, the, in each country. Sometimes you have more difference between... Uh, Antwerp and Charleroi, that in between Brussels and uh, Barcelona. Same country, but cult culture are different. So you need to, 
Just take the time to understand people. When you, when you do the, uh, the fishing stuff, I'm starting a PhD on fishing. Nobody's doing fishing anymore because fishing doesn't work. What they are doing is more spear fishing now. Even if it's large, because you take something that people know, where you know how they will react. The last thing was football. Uh, there was thing about the election. Why? Because it's something that you have in common on which you can, it's a trigger. You can leverage it. But if you talk about football in, I don't know, which country doesn't like football? Yeah, that's a, a bad idea. Yeah, maybe in America, indeed. <laughs> they will say American football, but if you say soccer, they yeah, it doesn't work. So you need to, to find what's, what click in each country and each culture. Okay, any, any more questions? Okay, so let's break for uh, 15 Thank you. minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>